two, one. What's up, Salt Strong Nation? Joe Simons. Look, Simons. Nailed it. Nailed it. This is going to be a good one. We've had a lot of people shooting in emails, a lot of people talking about some of the closures and things that have been happening here in the state of Florida. I know other states have their own, not to say issues, but then again, there are issues just making sure that we're taking care of the treasure that we have here as fishermen. And, and it's, it's a touchy subject because we want to go out there and catch fish and a lot of us want to harvest it. And some of us don't, some of us purely are practicing catch and release, but a lot of us, even me, I like to go out occasionally and, and keep a fish. And there's been some changes here recently that in some parts of Florida that you can't keep some of our, our favorite fish. We're going to talk all about that. And so I've been emailing back and forth with this gentleman here, Mr. Eric, can you, are you, hopefully you're on the video and you can see me. I see you. Yeah, man. How you doing? Dude, good to have you here. So we've been we've been eating be back here, and forth, and and I asked him, I was like, "Make, do you mind coming on?" And he's a fisheries biologist, so this is the guy getting a lot of the data that's making ultimately the decision on what is going to be the rules, what are going to be the regulations. I was like, "Do you mind just coming on and just kind of dispelling the myths that are out there, some of the misinformation, and just talking like real candid on why these decisions are being made and and why they're so important and and how this impacts all of us." as a, as fishermen. So dude, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited about it. So I wish I had a last name that rhymed with some uh, precious gem for sure. <laughs> well, it's weather. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. you got an easy to understand name. I, I had to do that because no one could pronounce my name. Hey, uh, Joe, is Joe Simmons here? <laughs> yeah. No, I got all kinds of stuff. So I'll admit I called you Joe Simmons for the first couple calls, man. <laughs> But yeah, weather like the weather outside. That's that's what I got for you. Cool. And so you're a fisheries biologist. Is that the title at FWC? Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm a fisheries okay. biologist at FWC here in St. Pete. Um, work at the uh, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, and I've been doing that for about oh, on and off for about twelve years now. Maybe maybe a little bit longer, but yeah. So one misconception, and the first time I email with you, just being honest, my impression of you is, oh, this is probably some science nerd who's never really been fishing. And I think, you know, when people hear about big closures, all of a sudden, they're just like, oh, these people have never even fished. But you're, I mean, you are a fisherman. I think you even had a little kind of a guy, eco guide service. Like what's, what's the background? Yeah, man, I got into this business because I love fishing. I love being outside, love being outdoors and, and on the water. And it's really, uh, you know, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So that's, just north of here a little bit where it's winter like all year round right yeah. um it's a, so, just a little bit north of here yeah just just a hair right <laughs> so you know fishing wasn't a huge part of my growing up because most of the things are frozen all, all the time but um, uh, as i got older you know i spent every second i could possibly spend outside you know around the lakes and, and rivers in western new york and just really fell in love with the environment you know and understanding the connections there was always of interest to me and i think uh the first time I really remember kind of connecting with the water was out on Lake Ontario. I was scuba diving at about 13 years old with my dad. And the, the, the weather on Lake Ontario is a little bit different than the Gulf of Mexico where, it, you know, the wind is always cranking. And it turned on while we were underwater. I came up to the surface and it was probably three to four foot seas. We're on a little 20 foot bay liner boat. And, uh, and my dad looked at me. He's like, oh, it's going to be rough going back. I was like, dad, I got this. And so I took the wheel, took us back in and it was, it's one of those moments I really remember kind of uh, being raised on the water, being raised by the water, something like that. You know, I think we all have those as people interested in the environment, you know, those, those moments we can point to. So That's that was awesome. certainly one for me. So did you go to, did you, did you go to school there in, in New York area? When did you come down here? Yeah, I went to school up in uh, University of Rhode Island. When I turned 18, I went as close, you know, straight to the ocean, as close to Buffalo as I could, you know, so that's, that's kind of the direct path. Uh, and um, yeah, I went to school for fisheries biology. I've always been interested in fisheries and, um, you know, more specifically focused on some of the anadromous fishes, you know, the salmon and, and trout. Um, I did a lot of fly fishing kind of growing up. So that was my specific area of interest. And I did that throughout college, but uh, focused on all areas of fisheries. Really cool program there where they get you in the field and you're out on boats and, you know, uh, fishing all the time using all kinds of different gears, trawl nets. Uh, worked on some commercial uh, lobster boats during the summers to you know make ends meet. Worked on a, tr a dragger for a little while, so got into the commercial side of things and just always really enjoyed that. 
That's cool. So you are definitely a fisherman and you've kind of, you've done a lot more than most people probably have at a, at a young age there. And so when, when did it come down to Florida and like, when did you start working with FWC? What's the background there? Well, that's a good question. So in, in college, I read a book by a, a Marine ecologist. His name was uh, Robert Johannes and he, he had this really interesting story. So he, he went out to Palau and he wanted to study sort of the, the fishing traditions around um, you know, the culture there, right? It's a really fishing based culture. And so the approach he took was to, you know, get with some of the, the tribal elders there and understand the, you know, the history of fishing and the fishing practices and uh, catalog it, you know, because it was, as everything is, you know, generations ch change and we're not necessarily learning at the feet of our elders anymore. We're learning in different ways. Um, so he wanted to catalog that. And I, I read through that book and it's like, and he realized some of the information that came from that tribal fishing community was just unbelievable, right? They knew more about uh, lunar spawning cycles in different uh, species of fish than the whole scientific community had documented throughout the world. And I, mm. that really blew me away. It was like, man, there's something about the connection between, you know, bridging the gap between the scientific information and the fishing community and the, the stakeholders that really kind of inspired me to take, you know, take on that sort of path in my career. So I went out to Northern California um, right after college. And again, I was interested in the salmon and the, uh, uh, the steelhead fishery out there. I uh, worked for the U.S. Forest Service, and we worked uh, worked in tandem with the uh, Klamath tribe up in the border of Oregon there on the Klamath River. It was just a phenomenal job. Um, some of the big issues out there were, you know, the relationship between ranchers extracting water from the, the river systems to, you know, obviously feed their crops, and the salmon uh, coming into the river, which was a traditional fishery for the, uh, you know, for the natives there. Um, and... There was something about it. I loved fishing up there. I mean, I'd, I'd go out, I'd work four tens so I could have three days just to fish on the rivers. And uh, I, I just really loved it. But I felt like, you know, my rights to fish, and I think you talked about this a little bit in your, your podcast, you know, a couple of weeks ago with uh, yeah. Sid, Sid Dobrin. Yeah. Um, you know, what is our right to fish, right? And so I didn't feel like I really had the right there. It's like, this is a, this is a, a thing between Native Americans who, you know, this is almost, they rely on this salmon run to uh, live really for not just this generation, but for generations past and hopefully generations to come in between ranchers who are more of an economic interest. Uh, and so I just didn't feel that was the right place for me to interject myself. Um, so I started looking for other opportunities and eventually that led me here to, here to Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, which is a whole different suite of, uh, you know, problems and issues. And they're all fun ones, right? It's amazing to I guess to be able to spend our time talking about fishing and um, have that be the focus of our careers. So I feel really blessed to be able to do that. And I'm excited about, uh, you know, having the opportunity to, to continue working on some of these cool problems. But. So what's my mindset when it comes to science and biology and, and, you know, kind of the trends of how these fish interact and feed and spawn it, to me, I want to, I want to, I want to, I'm trying to beat the fish, right? It's to me, like it's man versus fish. And it sounds like you have that in you as well. Cause you, you love fishing, but how, like you have to have a little bit different mindset too. Like when you're going in, right? Like you, you're not thinking, all right, how can I catch more fish or, or are you like, what, what's the mindset that a scientist has when it comes to looking at these, at these fisheries, when you're studying the science and the biology and like when you're, when you're just like in the zone looking at the stuff, like what, what, what's going through your mind? Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. You know, there's, there's two different perspectives and they relate to each other really closely. I'll, uh, I'll try to think of an analogy, but you know, as a scientist looking at a fish, you know, you, when you're a fisherman, you're going out, I want to catch fish this size, this species today. Right. So you're looking at a fish in a very certain spot and time and place. Um, as a biologist, the mindset is more like, you know, what is the, the life cycle of this fish? Where does he live throughout his life? Because by the time you're catching him or targeting him, they've gone through a whole, you know, a few years before that. And, you know, who knows what they've gone through to get to that point where you're interested in catching him. So we try to take into account, or I try to, you know, take the perspective of this fish is not just an individual in time, but is a whole life cycle living across different habitats and different areas. Um, and, you know, what are the impacts that are affecting this fish that I'm trying to target today, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah good. So, cool. yeah, that's, uh, 
you know, that's the approach. I think the state of Florida, what I love about working for FWC, man, I think they get, uh, they get the mission exactly right. Right. So the, the mission of FWC is to uh, manage fish um, and wildlife, obviously, uh, for their long-term well-being and the benefit of people. And I think that's just the, the exact right way to look at it. Right. It's, it's not a, it's not looking at fish as the priority. It's looking at the, you know the people that are involved in the fishery as really the reason we're out there. I always tell people, um, fishery science and fisheries management doesn't exist because there's fish. It exists because there's fishermen. And I think that's an important perspective to keep in mind. Hmm. Yeah, say say that again. That's that is important. Yeah. So fishery science and management doesn't exist because there are fish, right? It exists because there's people fishing. So. So they keep yeah, just because of the fisherman. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's yeah, well said, huh? So yeah. let's let's go right in that because I think there's so many fishermen, and especially from reading, you know, we have that Facebook group with fifty six thousand people, and majority of people are in the South, from like Texas to the Carolinas, and the majority of those people are in Florida, and. There was a lot of people right off the bat that were applauding this recent decision. And we'll talk about other ones, but I wanted to focus on this because it's, it's fresh and it's, you know, it's kind of created some controversy a little bit. And there was okay. a lot of people out there and they loved it. They're like, this is the best decision ever. They, they saw it. I, I could see it personally. Like my gut reaction was like, wow. Then I was like, you know what? Like, you know, a year's not that big a deal in the big scheme of things for my kids. I know you have young kids as well that you're, you're getting into fishing, you know, they would probably thank us for this. It's not that big a deal when you look at it on a broad perspective. And there's other people, like one guy reached out to me, like, you know, he's traveling with his whole family and has a big trip that he does to Florida every year. He does not live in Florida. And he, one of the big, you know, things that they love to do as a family was come down here and fish for a week and actually, you know, harvest some fish and, and feed the family. And he, he kind of put a damper on it. And I get that, um, especially if that was a, a tradition you had. It would be like, you know, having Thanksgiving and all of a sudden saying you can't have turkey for a year. Like, yeah, maybe not the end of the world, but it's like, man, it's my tradition. I want to, I want to have turkey at Thanksgiving. So like you got half the people that say it's an awesome idea, half that say it's not. And I don't think anyone really understands the data behind it. So let's talk about you. And I want to hear just the process of where do you guys get the data? How long do you study this stuff? Uh, just, just the whole process, I guess. Hey, Joe, you really laid it out there, man. I think we need to have this conversation about 30 miles offshore. This is a, this is a heavy one. <laughs> with some, so with there's some, a lot, cold, some cold beers. <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, so I guess, I guess the best place to start would be, you know, let's define, let's define fishermen for, you know, for us and for, you know, generations to come, right? And I think you're doing a really awesome job of that. It's one of the reasons I'm really excited about Salt Strong, what you guys are doing is, you know, you, you laid out that, uh, that coat of arms, right? And number one on that coat of arms was we believe, was it we believe uh, being a fisherman is a badge of honor, right? Badge of honor, yep. Exactly, man. And I, I 100% agree with you. So uh, when you say that, you know, there's, there's certainly, I guess, a lot to that, right? So what would be a fisherman that uh, isn't worthy of that badge of honor? Is it somebody that just goes out and fishes and doesn't really think about anything, you know? It's not for me to define. It's, I guess, maybe a personal question, but I think that really gets to what are the values that we're thinking about when we're fishing? Um, how are we acting out those values as fishermen? And, you know, what are the stories we're abstracting from those, you know, those actions that we're passing on to future generations? So I think those are, that's kind of an important thing to think about as fishermen. Are we people that are fishermen or are we just people that fish, right? Um, are we worthy of that badge of honor? And you talked about this again a little bit with Sid. Um, I liked his example or your example of using bait fish as a, you know, kind of a, a metric for how we feel about the fishery. Are we just dumping 300 white baits in the, in the uh, live well, you know, catching a couple of trout that day and then, you know, throwing them all in the trash can? Or are we, you know, taking care of this resource and using it and releasing these things back alive and teaching our future generations, like this is an important source as well as the fish we're trying to target. Yeah. Um, so I certainly think that's part of it. And that's part of the story that we need to put together as fishermen worthy of the badge of honor. Um, that, uh, you know, that's something we need to keep in mind. So, you know, if you've talked to somebody in the Southeast of, you know, the, the East coast of Florida, um, I think you would, 
they would tell you that bait is not an unlimited supply, right? Over there, they're having trouble finding bait. And every time you go to a bait spot, there's two boats on it with sabiki rigs, right? Um, so bait is not an unlimited supply. And it's something we need to consider as honorable fishermen, right? As fishermen um, for the long-term health of our fishery. So that's kind of the first part, you know, figuring out this story that we're passing on. Um, as far as the science goes, the way FWC has designed the, uh, you know, the process, I think is, I mean, it's, there's a lot to that. It goes way back, not way back, but it goes back a few years to, I guess, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which was the necessary piece of uh, legislature um, put in place to you know, basically put some boundaries around what fishing is on the federal perspective, right? Yeah. So there was commercial fleets fishing right along our coastlines, taking all these fish, um, and that needed to change or they were going to basically wipe out all these fisheries. So they, you know, came up with some, some legislature and defined some, um, defined some roles, right? So they defined, well, there's fishery science, which is designed to develop information to put into a stock assessment to give us a stock status. That information was then going to go to fisheries managers, and those managers would be able to use that information along with some knowledge that they were able to acquire from the fishing industry and fishermen um, to make decisions for the long-term benefit of the, the fishery, right? And is that, and is that how it works at FWC? Is that, is yeah. that two sides? Yeah. Essentially, you got the scientist and then someone who's making an ultimate decision based on your, your data. Your, your, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So in FWC, we kind of follow that same model, right? So it's, uh, and, and that's part of the, you know, the, the state uh, constitution, right? FWC was established and whenever possible, we should follow these, um, these things that are already working in the, you know, other places. But um, yeah, so in FWC, we have uh, fisheries, just from a fisheries perspective, it's a huge organization that tackles lots of different issues for wildlife and land management and all that other stuff. But as it relates to fisheries, there's a fishery science, a marine fishery science section. There's also a marine fisheries management section, which is separate. And then there's obviously law enforcement to, uh, you know, monitor these regulations. So in the marine fishery science, the components to that are first, there's a fisheries dependent monitoring program. And the, the operations uh, that it's charged with are to monitor the take, basically what fishermen are catching and extracting from the population. Uh, and they how, do that how do they through, do that? Yeah, they do that through you know scientific, scientifically designed surveys. Um, like the let's see, one good example would be the uh, uh, MRIP program, the Marine Recreational Intercept Program. Um, that's more of a federal, uh, federally kind of a managed thing. But in the Gulf Coast here, we have the Gulf Reef Fish Survey. So when you get a fishing license, you check the box: Are you going to fish for reef fish? Um, you check that box and that makes you eligible for this Gulf Reef Fish Survey, which is to get an idea of fishing effort, um, uh, recreational fishing effort. Um, there's also dock intercepts. So you might run across somebody, you know, a scientist um, standing at the dock when you get, when you park the boat and they'll be asking you questions, doing interviews to figure out, you know, what fish you were targeting, how much you caught, stuff like that. So that's all fisheries dependent monitoring. And that's really important information, what's coming out of the population, how much effort's going in. Um, so the, the, I guess another side of that, um, important information for stock assessments is the fisheries independent monitoring program. Um, that's the section that I, I work for. And what that is charged with is, uh, monitoring fish populations independent of what's coming out. So we're out there collecting our own data on our own boats, um, through standardized statistically valid methods, um, to develop, you know, indices of relative abundance through time. And that program was established by the state uh, in 1989, so it's been going on for a long time, right? So we're out there every month um, in, I think, seven different estuaries throughout the, the state of Florida, uh, pulling nets, pulling trawls in different habitats. And we're looking at, you know, catch per unit effort in these different habitats and different years for, you know, 30 years now. And so we have a really good baseline data. You think about that as like, um, I guess, uh, kind of like the the vital statistics from you know a health assessment right so you take you take the pulse of uh, somebody maybe some blood pressure and stuff like that so that's kind of what, what the fisheries independent monitoring is doing what's going on in the fish population independent of the you know the take so like t 
You said a lot of big words there. You know, I, I went to Georgia Tech because um, my SAT scores were almost like perfect on the math. And I had like a 500 on the English, which couldn't get me to any normal school. So I don't know. Well, you trust me, man. That's a- <laughs> I might have been 480. It was really bad. But anyhow, um, I, can you put that in English? You said like indices and like, so what, it, what does it mean in just layman terms, like on a normal, let's just say a quarter or whatever, however often you guys are monitoring stuff. Are, what are you doing when you're on the water? Are you actually catching the fish and taking samples? Are you throwing the net? Like what, what are you doing to, to get the data? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. The fun stuff. That's what yeah. I love to do. <laughs> so we take out uh, in these different estuaries. We've got Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Indian River Lagoon, um, Jacksonville. We've got an Apalachicola Bay Lab. Um, and let's say Cedar Key, we've got one up there. So in all these different areas, we're, we're using these same fishing gear. So seine nets, uh, we have a 600-foot seine net. We have a 70-foot seine net. Um, and these are designed to capture fish at different life stages, right? So the smaller seine net will go into shorelines or along into seagrass beds and, uh, you know, pull a sample. We'll, we'll trip the bag and pull up these uh, fish, count and measure everything um, from the smallest, you know, little gobies all the way up to, you know, whatever snook and redfish and trout we're catching there too. Um, we release and measure them, you know, enumerate them, release them alive. And, uh, you know, that's, like I said, that's been going on in these estuaries for a long time. So we can then get these data points on basically the health of the fishery through time and come up with a trend line. So um, if catches are higher this year than last year, we can, you know, look at individual species. We can look at entire communities. We can look at specific areas. Um, so a good example of the utility of this, these data are uh, the 2010 cold kill, right? So the, the 2010, we had a couple of cold weeks in January, a bunch of snook died in Tampa Bay yeah. and south of here as well, right? Um, so the, the question is, well, how many snook died? And, and that's not really the question we're after. It's what is the impact on the fishery and how quickly does it recover? And that's exactly what the fisheries independent survey is designed to answer. Um, so we were able to look at, you know, the impacts of that specific event over time, you know, so we looked at it historically, where, are, where have snook populations been? What happened in 2010? How did they drop off in our catch per unit effort per sample? Yep. And how did they then uh, rebound through time? And you saw the regulations kind of follow that scientific information, right? So it was like, all right, there's a closure this year. They looked at the data again after that, the, the fisheries management side looked at the data. Um, and then there was a, you know, after I think, a year, they said, all right, let's keep it closed another year. And then we saw that it was enough to rebound. Hi, how are you? So, hi, Mr. Eric. Hi. <laughs> you going fishing today? She can't hear you because I got the headphones on. <laughs> oh, gotcha, yeah. You're going to go fish? We're going this weekend, aren't we? We're going to go see how many, uh, how many fish are actually down there. <laughs> so, sorry, Savannah, this is, this is why um, you don't do a, a podcast when uh, the kids are out of school early. <laughs> Yeah, man. Right, say, say good. <laughs> the, uh... um, so on that question, how I'm playing devil's advocate. Yeah, go. So, Cause there's obviously some days everything's on fire and you're seeing bait and everything's everywhere. And so I think a lot of people would say, well, Hey, what if FWC only went out and you know took that 70 foot St. Net on a day that was just bad and all the bait was pushed out somewhere. And, they made a decision based on that, right? And and saying right. I have been pulled over to dock, and let's just say it was a bad day. And they're like, "Well, man, no one caught anything today." And then the next day, it's on fire again. And so, like, how how often are you going out and, and getting data from these different uh, main points you mentioned? Yeah, I love that example, man. I love those days when everything's on fire and just the <laughs> surface, too. the water's blowing up, man. That's that really gets me excited, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so good question. So if you show up to our office any morning around 7 o'clock, there's like a flotilla of boats going out pretty much every day, right? So we've got, you know, scientists on the water all the time. And I think that's really the thing to stress. You know, we, we do about 104, 105 uh, samples in Tampa Bay alone per month, every month. And we do that throughout the month, you know, on a bunch of different trips. Um, so we've got boats on the water all the time, you know, so the idea is, you know, through random sampling, we want to randomly select these sites on different habitats. Um, and that allows us to extract the information from that single sample and make some inferences about the populations as a whole, right? Um, so that's one of the, the, the uh, key pieces of statistical um, 
information we need there. Huh. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, so how many times in Tampa, you said? A month? Sorry about that, man. I got the neighbors uh, running the weed whacker over here. Oh, no, hey, that's – and if you, guys, if you guys are listening to the podcast, my little four-year-old daughter came in, and, and you know, for you guys watching the video, you could probably see her. But, uh, yeah, that's, it's, that's the fun part about doing these live podcasts. That's right, man. That's why I'm saying we should just go offshore and just make it happen, you know? <laughs> so what were the stats on, on Tampa? Yeah, so about 100, 100 plus samples per, per month, every month of the year over the past, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, so we're out there all the time, you know, trying to keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on with the populations out there. Um, and that allows us to, you know, track those things like recovery through time. You know, a big question that I get a lot now is, you know, what's happening with the fish in regards to the red tide that happened last year. Yep. And that's exactly what we can do with our, with our data, you know. Um, so we can look at, you know, these different pulses, different effects of events um, and analyze those and, and submit that information. So this is the next part of your earlier question. We take that information, um, we submit that to either stock assessment scientists who can then look at single species and how it impacts single species. And then they provide that to the fisheries managers or we'll just give some information like on, you know, red tide to the right to the fisheries managers where they take that scientific information and they take information they're hearing from the fishing community and they sort of compile it together to make decisions, right? So I'm on the science side. There's a whole separate side that's doing the management, the decision making or making recommendations to the commission about what they think, uh, you know, fishing regulations should happen. So I think that's, you know, that's really the point in which your listeners, your, your salt strong crew can impact, you know, the future of their fisheries and take some responsibility. Certainly a relationship with the science, but a lot of the science is designed around statistically, you know, valid methods of collecting data. Um, we're certainly open always to doing special projects, looking at, at certain, you know, certain things that might be happening out there. But we have these long-term surveys designed to specifically answer you know, questions about what's happening through time. Um, so as far as where your listeners can get involved, it's with that relationship with the management portion of uh, FWC and you know, making recommendations, letting them know what's, what's happening out there on the water. And what's, what's the best way to do that? How do you have a relationship with them? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so that's uh, information is available through myfwc.com. Who is your regional fisheries biologist um, that's working with the management team there and you can connect with them. There's, there's one for each uh, region and then there's, you know, the, the regional um, fisheries managers as well. So, but yeah, you can connect with me too and I can point you in the right direction. That's no problem. So how, um, that's interesting. You mentioned that they're taking some data as well, you know, from real people that, that are interacting. How much does that play? And like, have you ever seen them reverse something? Like if all of a sudden they got 20,000 emails from ticked off inshore fishermen in Hillsborough County, like would they, is, how, how much, I guess is the question, do they take that into account? Like how much, how much you got science and you have people and right what's what's the i know there's not like a ratio they use but. <laughs> that's a great question man and that's really kind of outside of my scope of work right so so i'm really focused on collecting this information to provide to them for you know statistically valid information um how much they take into account i guess it depends on species what they're hearing you know regions stuff like that so you know a lot of it is who's making the, the loudest sounds too right so i think it, the right way to look at it is as a fishing community we should be you know, talking to these people and, and having having a relationship with uh, these different entities, science and management, um, so that they are getting the most informed opinion. You know, they hear a bunch of people saying uh, something's going on with blackfin tuna, right? And so they keep hearing this and hearing this and hearing this. Eventually, it's going to pop up on their radar where they need to put in place a fisheries management plan. Um, and so they're looking at, you know, how much science is available on that? What are the people saying? And then trying to develop some avenues for people to comment on the, the potentially proposed uh, decisions that they'll be making. So it's looking out for those opportunities to comment on those uh, proposed regulations, which I know Dylan Hubbard has been really involved in in the last few years and getting involved with that stuff. So that's, I mean, that's an awesome thing. Yeah. And I mean, he, he's mentioned that he's one of our fishing coaches here at Salt Strong. He's, he's mentioned yep. that I think he said, I mean, this past 12 months, 
he spent like 42 full days. That's which is a lot. I mean, of his own personal time where he could be going out making money and doing charters uh, in meetings with FWC and the Gulf Coast Council just to have a voice. And he's like, it's, it's disappointing how few people ever show up to any of these meetings where they, they want to hear from us. Like they true, I mean, they, they want, no one wants to make a bad decision and yeah, you have to have the science that's critical and you can't make a good decision without real scientific evidence, but you still need to to listen to the community, as you said. And uh, I would recommend everyone, and this is not a pitch for FWC, but then again, I guess it is, but get on the email list. I mean, you should probably be on there if, if you've ever bought a license and stuff, I assume in Florida, but I get emails from you guys all the time just to see what's going on. Some things, you know, not as pertinent to me, but sometimes like, oh man, like I'm glad I, I'm glad I knew about that. And they do let you know well in advance when they're having a meeting. And I mean, they truly do want, want people there. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's critical information, right? So I, I kind of, let me see, I kind of picture it on a, a in a, in a musical landscape, right? So you have a, you have a song, but if you hand me a sheet of music, I don't necessarily have a song with me. I just have kind of data points on a sheet, right? Um, fishermen are the ones out there playing the song. So we need to, you know, know what's in between the notes and we might not have all the notes right on the science side. So you got to help us, you know, kind of, oh, that sounds good. And this doesn't sound good. Um, so kind of developing, developing the song on multiple levels, I think is, is kind of the right way to look at that. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're right on. Get on the mailing list. Uh, if there's something that you are, you know, specifically targeting that you're interested in, comment on those things. You know, what are you seeing in your fishery? Because, uh, you know, FWC is trying to make decisions for the entire state of Florida. Well, we all know these are very regional or localized problems in a lot of cases. So, um, so th- how do you do that? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Um, my contention is, you know, the over the long term, what's the what does the future of this look like if everything happened perfectly? Right. So that's the question I constantly ask myself. And I think it, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned before with that, uh, Johannes book, um, words of the lagoon. Um, it's a, from my perspective, I think the best way forward would be to sort of develop a process of, you know, community based fisheries management where the community is actually developing fisheries management plans and using relying on, scientific information to kind of refine the you know the parameters of that plan using information from fisheries managers to uh, help refine the rules what works what doesn't work um, how do we get how do we enforce some of these things so I know it's a much it sounds nice but it's a much more complex thing than that when you're talking about huge regions and huge fisheries um, but I really think that's there's some work going towards that you know there's workshops that happen around um, kind of gauging what is the community really look like? What is this uh, fishery that we're trying to manage? Because there's, you know, uh, economic impacts that, you know, there's, it's much more than just an ecological problem. Right? Yeah. So th- to go back on this, um, this most recent change with redfish and stuck and trout, right. On, on, for your end on the science side, are you hearing from the management side of the stock people saying, Hey, uh, for the next 30 days, I want you guys just to target snook or redfish or trout. Are, are you, or, and or does that happen like after a big red tide? Are you going species specific or are you still just doing the general, just life, marine life in general of the area? Yeah, that's a great question, man. You know, our survey design um, ideally is, is designed so we pick up all the signals across the, you know, the both the habitat ranges and the life stages of these different fish. So a, a fisheries manager might say to us, give us your snook data. Well, we don't have a specific snook survey, but we have a survey that encompasses snook, so we can pull those information out for young of the year fish, for one-year-old fish, for you know, sub-adult and, and ideally adult fish, so we can look at the stock in different ways uh, there. And that's exactly what we're doing with these things. You know? For adult trout, you know, they may have got hit by the, the red tide pretty hard. So they may say, give us your adult trout data and let's see what the what it looks like compared to last year and the year before and the year before and the year before, you know. So that's that's kind of the, the design of us, the design of our survey there. Um, so like when you, when you see data, like are you getting it and saying, oh, like do you know in advance, like, man, they're going to have to shut this down? Like is it, is it evident or? Well, not necessarily, no. Um, because there's so much going on, you know, we're pulling so many samples a month and, you know, it's a, it's a lot to really go through, not until you really sit down and uh, we have a couple of analysts that really focus on extracting meaning from all that data we're collecting. 
in uh, providing that information to the managers. So I, I would say there's some indications, you know, that we see on the water, just like fishermen see on the water. Um, oh man, we haven't caught this in this area in a while and we usually see them this time of year, right? So uh, juvenile redfish is a good one. Um, we typically catch those November through February in the kind of the upper river areas, Manatee River, Little Manatee River, where they settle out after they've spawned. Um, and what we've looked at through some previous analysis has shown that it takes really three good recruitment years of those juvenile redfish to equal one year of fishermen saying, oh, this is a good fishing year, right? So we need to see that, that three-year signal of recruits before we know that there'll be a, an upcoming uh, good fishery. Um, and we haven't really seen that in the last few years. So that's translating into what I think you guys are seeing on the water, and certainly I'm seeing red fishing as well. Uh, it's been a lot slower in the last few years. The juvenile recruitment hasn't been um, substantially lower than it has in other low spots in the past, so we're not super concerned about it at this point. But, uh, you know, it's definitely something to take a look at. Does it go back up at some point? Or keeping our finger on the pulse, I guess, is the right analogy for that. That's good. So what what's the percentage number in, in general, meaning uh, if the stock is down 10%, is that just, oh, that's just a normal fluctuation? Obviously, it was down 50%. That should probably cost some alarms. But is there a certain number where where, where FWC in general is saying, all right, it, this we got we to take action on this now? Yeah, that's a good question, man. That, and this is uh, where a lot of my conversations go is towards the management decision side. And, it, you know, maybe it'd be really helpful to have a fisheries manager on this podcast to answer some of those. But um, I don't know. You know, I think it's, again, it's both those things. What is the impact on the fishery from the data side? What are the fishermen seeing out there? And they try to take into account both those things, um, you know, for the long-term benefit of the fishermen, right? Dude, you're, you're – Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I think your neighbor's uh, helping you out doing your house now. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, man? I think your neighbor's helping you out and doing uh, your house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Appreciate that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So the one thing that I was confused on. Okay, go. And maybe you have to defer this to management, but um, it's like, why, why? And I think a lot of people shared the same thing. Like, it was like, all right, this is good. But what made them decide to say an entire year? Why not? It, why not? It would be a whole lot easier to say, hey, we're going to shut it down for the summer and then reevaluate. So I think the question comes down to, you know, how often do you guys reevaluate? Like, what, what, how bad does it have to be for any kind of entity like FWC to say, we have to like completely shut down the harvesting of these species for a year or six months or 18 months, wherever it might be? Right. But yeah, that's a great question, man. And you're exactly right. That's a, a management side uh, oh, come question. On, come <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. So I could provide numbers and, and uh, look at what's happening in the population. It, we, we do collect samples monthly. We analyze them, you know, as quickly as we possibly can. There's usually a few months turnaround to that. Um, and then they make recommendations based on their fisheries management plan on, on what to recommend to the commission to do. Right. So, so I understand. Yeah. You, uh, you, yeah. You have to, yeah. So my, my phone is constantly blowing up with text messages. Like, why did you close the fishery? It's like, why did I close the fishery, man? I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. So I understand where you're coming from and I, I just can't really I comment. On that. In yeah. your experience, have you ever seen them reverse? Cause I, I felt like something happened like in the last month or so where they were going to make a decision up in the panhandle about limiting trout from five to three. And I, I shame on me for not knowing the exact, uh, rules it seems to be changing a lot and then they 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 cancel that like do you see them making changes did, did that happen or is that about my imagination well i know they're really receptive to you know to public comment and the more the better you know especially the more like your salt strong community the more positive the better like all right we understand what you did here let's take a look at this and maybe we don't need to do it in this this region and then they can come back and ask us for the data uh, look at some of the science and you know maybe refine those regulations um, so I, I think that's an opportunity for you and your, you know, your, your listeners to, um, check into that. If you don't hundred percent agree with something, well, let's look at, you know, some of the more fine scale uh, decision-making and maybe there's a time frame that, uh, you disagree with or a, a size limit or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think that's an opportunity to build that relationship, you know, in a positive way and look at the impacts of these, these management decisions. Yep. And so we, we already talked about like, um, 
I guess you guys have a list of, you know, who's in charge of what, is it district or what is it an area? What, what is it? For yeah, they have like a region. Um, region. Okay. Yep. yep. They, they break it up into region and there's a, a manager that'll make, you know, they'll get tasked with different projects. So if you'd like that information, I could provide you with the uh, regional biologists for sure. Yeah, and we'll definitely put a, a link in the in the show notes for everyone. I'll to, give you their cell phone number so you can just call them. Oh, I'm boy, just kidding. I love that. <laughs> so, in, in t- like, w- what what do they do? Meaning, I know their ultimate role is to make the, the decision and, uh, and and obviously help enforce it. Uh, are they are they spending time in these you know like Facebook groups like ours? Are they on forums? Are they out in the water with with you guys? The the data you know, gathers the scientists, what else, what else are they doing? Are they out fishing and looking at samples? Fisheries managers. Uh Um, Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're people just like anybody, you know, a lot of them are fishermen and some of them are (laughs) scientists, you know, there's a wide range of uh, of different individuals, just like in the science sector, just like in the fishing sector. Right. Um, So yeah, I mean, they're paying attention wherever they can. You know, I know a lot of the guys have a routine, you know, they stop by tackle shops, talk to the tackle people, um, just like I do, you know, I want to know what's going on in the fishery as well. So um, I, they are paying attention, right? And they have avenues set up where they can collect information in a, you know, in a kind of a managed way, um, and which is really the best way for fishermen to engage, you know, that process. Mm-hmm. Just like the fisheries management councils, you know, offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, we also have a fisheries independent survey. And, you know, the FWC is collecting information on the fishery. Um, through those fishery dependent surveys as well. So, I mean, it's not, uh, these are not state versus federal problems necessarily. This is like everybody trying to work together to get to good answers. Just like fishermen, they might fish one day inshore, next day offshore. Does that mean they're two separate fishermen? No, they're really, you know, it's really one person doing it. So it's a, it's a community, right? Yeah. I love it. Um, what do you think, what do you think is the best data in general? Meaning, um, if, if you could have one piece of data, what do you think is the best for you? And that could be you being out there with a seine net on a day. It could be sitting at one marina and literally checking the, the catches and talking to the boaters or spending an all day in a tackle store. Like, what do, you, what do you think in general? If you had a gun to your head and had to pick one, what's like the best data? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, man. It's all important. Yeah, it's it's just like, tough, this is a tough podcast. Yeah, it's like asking the question, you know, if you could take one rod to one place and sit there for, yeah, you know, the rest of your off. life. Yeah, if you could only use one club, yeah, you got to gotta play. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah, man. So, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, that's a really tough one. But both those pieces, fisheries dependent and fisheries independent, need to work together. We need to know, you know, what the fish, fishery is doing and what's coming out of the fishery through extraction. Um, so those are, those are t- the two pieces that I think, uh, really need to be in place to assess the fishery. You get rid of one of those and you lose a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, you can't just assess a fishery based on take because, you know, it changes with regulations. It changes with season. It changes with uh, weather. You know, there's too many, too many variables in there to really assess what's going on in the actual fishery based on just what fishermen are doing. Um, so you need that fishery independent component. Um, but then again, you know, the fishery independent component is really, you know, designed to be a statistically valid uh, uh, survey. So you may miss those things, those, uh, you know, those things that the fishermen are seeing. You, you won't get that uh, extraction component as right as it could be, right? So you'll have a lot of error around some of those estimates. So you need all that. You need it all. And we also have a fisheries biology uh, specific uh, component to our, our uh, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute that's focused on, you know, specific problems. So they do a lot with, um, you know, how many, you know, what's the reproductive ability of, of certain species of fish. So they study the, you know, the, the fecundity, the gonads, they count eggs. And we have an aging section that looks at, you know, all the otoliths that are being extracted from both fisheries dependent. Uh, lost you there. Nope, and fish, yeah. All right, perfect. Fisheries dependent and fisheries independent uh, otoliths from the fish. They're aging them, figuring out what the age structure of the fishery is. Um, there's also a tagging and movement section. So they're looking, they're tagging fish acoustically, both on fine scale and, and broad scale um, studies to look at movement of fish. Uh, so there's a lot going on, you know, and, and that's really the place where we've seen success in incorporating fishermen into the science and saying, oh, we're seeing this specific thing. Um, can we design a study that will 
provide valuable information for the stock assessment assessors in that capacity, right? So hogfish was a good example of that a few years ago. Um, so hog fishermen wanted to know what the, you know, what the structure of the hogfish fishery was. And, and so they got with some of the researchers at FWC and other partners and um, designed a survey, uh, designed a two year study around that and provided some really interesting information, which is now, you know, some of the genetic component of that has gone to the regulations where they have found three different population, one in the Keys, one on the East Coast, and one here in the Gulf, and made different regulations around those. So that was, a, that's a great example of how the fishermen have, have been able to come into the, uh, the science portion and provide valuable insight. Cool. All right. So other side of the spectrum, I put you on the spot and made you choose. Now, <laughs> if money was not an issue from the science yeah. side of things and you could have any type of Intel, maybe it could be an app that's not, you know, where every fisherman is always putting in literally every single catch they have. And I, that's, I don't know that'll ever happen, but like, what's the one thing like, man, I wish we had, I wish we had like easy access to this data. Is there anything that, that doesn't exist yet that is kind of future based? Well, that's a good question, man. You know, there's the, uh, the old statement, there's the things we know that we know, there's the things we know that we don't know, and there's the things we don't know that we don't know. Right. So it's like, there's a whole bunch of, this is a really complex system we're trying to figure out. Um, and we're trying to figure it out from a lot of different angles, but I would say in the Gulf of Mexico, in Florida in general, um, yeah, recreational fishing effort is really hard to estimate. Um, and so, I, yeah, I would say that is kind of the piece of data we really need to uh, work on together to try to figure out how to get better estimates of recreational fishing data. Because this isn't like, you know, Alaska or New England or really any other fishery in the world where um, you have more of a commercial interest in fishing than a recreational interest. Um, here we have, I, I don't know what the estimates are, like 11 million recreational fishermen yeah. going out of, you know, uh, hundreds of different uh, inlets and outlets and, and on the bays and on the bridges. And, you know, it's impossible to really get a good estimate of that without some direct communication with the fishermen. Um, so, yeah, maybe an app-based design is something we've been thinking about. Uh, and I think there's some utility to that. We need to really think about what questions we ask. and, and yeah. um, I'd really like to see that come from the fisherman side saying, this is what we're, you know, what we'd like to ask and uh, the information we'd like to provide and what we'd like to see from that. So I think there's some opportunity there, but I, it, again, it all goes back to, I think the, what is a fisherman, the ethic of, of fishing, right? Um, I think back to a book I read about uh, Eddie Aikau, the uh, surfer out in Hawaii, a legendary big wave surfer. The, the book was called Eddie would go right. And the, he became an icon, not because of his ability to surf these huge waves, but because he went to, he was in Waimea Bay, grew up there, and he took on the responsibility of being the lifeguard on the beach there. And, you know, he's, it's like, not only can I surf these waves, but I take the responsibility of anybody that surfs here, I'm going to make sure they stay alive. And that's really what was iconic about him. And I think it's the same thing in fishing. Um, I relate that to, I, I am a fisherman. I take on the responsibility of how I act and the story I tell to my kids and future generations so that fishing is, is good for the long term. Now, how we do that, you know, genera generationally will really, I think, determine the future. I see us, I see a failure and from one of my mentors, Bob Hagee, he puts it this way, a failure of, of fishery science and management and a fisherman is, you know, our grandkids going out in the water, looking over the side of the boat, seeing a bunch of fish down there and telling the story. You know, back in the day, we used to be able to put a hook in the water and catch those things. You know, that's failing, right? I think we all agree on that. So um, it's up to all of us really to work together to avoid that trap. Yeah. So what, um, what's the biggest challenge like right now that FW, FWC is facing in, in general? Is, is there one that's like... Um, it's like at the top of, uh, of everyone. And obviously recently with, you know, this Gulf coast, some closures, like, is there anything else? Like just like a number one challenge that, man, we, this is, this is like at the very top of the list of things that we got to fix. Not necessarily because all challenges are challenges, right? So yeah, <laughs> assessing, you know, what's going to happen next year with red tide or hurricanes or any of these things, you know, they're all, you never know what the future holds. Um, but I think, I think the biggest challenge that, you know, we can actually tackle and work together on is this relationship between management, uh, fishermen, scientists, building this community. So I think that's, I guess that's the challenge we're tasked with because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. and It's really hard to predict those things, right? 
what so do you guys have any any prediction on this next red tide season i don't have any prediction for you man i don't i don't know uh <laughs> Looks like it's not out there right now, but that you know that's based on some limited data points, and who knows? I, I don't know, man. How, how but, do you how do you guys count the dead fish? That's another question I always had. I don't know you can't count them one by one; you have to take samples. But how when I hear about so much tonnage or whatever that a crazy number was a million pounds, how, how right. do you how do you guys get at that? Yeah, so we get it the same way that uh, you know we we get at the the cold kill. So we don't count dead fish; we count the the fish that are still alive, um, in a relative way, so that we can see what the population is after the event, and then the, the subsequent recovery of that population. Um, so we keep an eye on what what impact it had in the recovery, rather than going out there and counting dead fish. So it's so, not, not no one's sitting there trying to count everyone all, all million dead snook or you no know, that's for sure but uh, you know we do try to take whatever information we can from you know from those events you know especially with like Goliath Gripper I know we went out and uh, collected a bunch of uh, otoliths to get some age structure on the fish that are dying um, or dead so I mean, we try to use any opportunity to collect that that data that we can but um, that's an unfortunate one for sure cool. So with like your, your metrics on the science side, you know, like um, our employees here at South Strong all have different metrics they're trying to hit to make sure we're doing like, what, what do you guys have in terms of what's keeping you guys in check and, and just making sure that the data you're getting, giving to the people making decisions is always correct and, and how often is it, you know, being reevaluated, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we have uh, specific, you know, deadlines for, for, projects and a lot of our funding is grant funding almost all of it right it's a lot of science is soft money um, so we're constantly trying to apply for new grants to answer new questions or keep long-term surveys going um, so that's certainly a, always a, a, an exciting challenge right yep. um, uh, the same with you you know we're, we're trying to hit uh, you know we're trying to collect a certain amount of samples every month and process those in a timely manner and you know get that data up to management as quickly as we possibly can so uh, there's a ton of people working on you know just keeping that data, the data flow going. Cool. And what, what do you think about um, any other tips that we can be doing as fishermen? Like any, anything come to mind besides, you know, treating it like a badge of honor and yeah. specific things like um, it could be from just leaving trash out to just killing too many fish or whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, that's a good question, man. I've been thinking about that as well. Um, and I guess I have the same question for you, but uh, um I've been thinking about the use of descending devices in offshore fisheries, right? Nobody likes to catch a red snapper out of season and let it float away. So uh, implementing some, you know, use of descending devices, sequelizer or something like that um, as a, uh, not certainly not mandatory, but as a, you know, kind of a, a way to teach our future generations, like this is an important fish. Um, it's out of season. It's not the right size. We're going to let it go back to its habitat, you know, as, as well as we can. Um, so that, that's one one area that I'm specifically interested in is descending devices offshore. Um, but yeah, all those things, man. It's uh, it's just how you how you treat the fishery, right? What do you leave behind you? What's your footprint? What's the story you're telling? Yep. Yeah, I think, uh, and that was the big takeaway I had with with Sid. Yeah. Is it, we almost need a, a kind of an entire cultural mindset shift. You know, it's, it is our job uh, as, as fishermen, if it's a badge of honor to us to, to one, to take the next generation out fishing, but number two, to just teach them what's right and, and, and what's wrong. And I grew up, uh, it, you know, fortunately in a, in a family that fished for multiple generations in Florida and my son's a fourth generation Floridian now. And, you know, it, growing up though, you kind of just killed whatever you kept, like whatever you caught. I mean, you literally kept everything, it, assuming it was legal. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that these days. And if I had that same mindset with my kids, I think that's, I think that's doing a disservice to the, to the fisheries. And as Sid said, I mean, it, it in most other countries, it, it is, it is not a right. It's not a right to fish. I mean, it is a real big privilege. And in a lot of countries, they can't do that. Like it's, it's abnormal to be able to go out on a beach or a bridge or a pass or in a boat or a kayak and literally go out there and catch fish and keep them at all in many countries that's unheard of 
I mean, yep. it's the commercial fishermen can, but not the recreational guys. So, I mean, we have a, an amazing, uh, you know, privilege, not a, not a right. And I, I, I think we do have to be careful not, not to abuse it. And um, not to say that, you know, FWC is completely perfect because they're not just like salt. No one is uh, just like no fisherman is. I mean, to your point earlier, I, everyone's been out there. If you've been offshore fishing or even inshore fishing and you deep hook a fish or you know, you have a snapper that you just can't get back down to the bottom in time. I mean, it happens and it, and it hurts you, especially if you really care about it. It's, no one's perfect, but I think we still have to work together to, to just try to make sure that those, you know, our kids and their kids have those same opportunities that, that we did where, you know, we're not sitting there with our grandkids and saying that, Oh yeah, you, you should have seen it back in the day. You could actually catch a fish here. I mean, that is, that's pretty eye opening. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, man. It's a it's a mindset shift, and I think it's not a it, it's a hard issue to tackle, right? Because, um, like you said, how you grew up, you know, catching fish for meat, right? Um, and I think that's where fishing sort of began for humans as a as a as a race, right? It's like uh, way back when I can imagine the first fishermen going out to the ocean, and you know, like, oh my goodness, this is going to sustain our whatever our tribe, our village for you know the rest of our our lives and stuff so i think that's where it started is sort of a a deep connection with this ocean with this you know source of uh, survival and we still see that today i know little kids you take them out to the beach and they look out at the water and it's like man just like i can't even imagine the things that are living out under that surface of water it's not exactly obvious that that's a beautiful thing to look at but to us we're like wow look at that flat blue surface it's absolutely beautiful and it really sparks all those things and um, I certainly see that in my kids, you know, it's like there are things under there that are so unbelievably beautiful and diverse and there's beasts that could eat me, you know, it's like it brings all those components together for, for our younger ones. And even for us, I think in some sense. So it's an important thing to work on and uh, work together on. And you're right. We're absolutely blessed to have these types of problems to, to, uh, you know, focus on in our lives. So yep. I think it's, a, I think it's a, it's a worthy challenge working together to, you know, make this thing sustainable over the long haul. Cool. All right. So, um, I see I've taken up a ton of your, uh, your time here. This has been good, man. Um, we always say that on every podcast episode, we try to have some kind of tip. So what, what's a tip for, let's just stick with inshore based on your science, your, all your knowledge in the science-based side of things, any, any tip, it, it could be a specific bait that you're seeing inside of snook or redfish or trout more often than not, whether it be pinfish or mullet, like any, uh, any specific tip you got to share? Yeah. Good question, man. I, I that's why I watch salt strong podcasts so I can get the <laughs> tips and go fishing. <laughs> um, but not really, I think, you know, what we saw with snook last year, um, was something pretty interesting. We're doing a study looking at, uh, distribution and range of snook and recently they've been shocking them about 200 river miles up the, uh, uh up in almost to Georgia, almost to the border of Georgia. So the range expansion of snook has been unbelievable. So you can go up to Cedar Key and do some snook fishing, which has never, ever happened before, right? Um, and then even further north of that. So I would, uh, I would say venture into those new places. You know, the, the old fishing spots that you're used to, those are still good to visit. But, you know, use fishing as an opportunity to explore. Keep getting out there and, and finding new spots and taking the kids there, showing them what it's all about. Cool. That would be my best tip. I don't know about baits and stuff, man. That's your area. You got any tips for me? How can I catch more, uh, more, uh, snook this year? Oh, Hey, what? that's, that's just like a layup. You got to join the insider club. I mean, come on. Nice. All right. Good, <laughs> good pitch. <laughs> hey, that'll be a whole other 30 minute podcast here. Yeah. If you um, want the real information about FWC, you got to join the FWC insider club. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. We got to team up, man. That's, that's good. Yeah, that sounds good man. Uh, I'd love to work with you more and, uh, you know, figuring out some of these things. Yeah, ditto. I, I think, and I, I'm just as guilty. I have not been going to these meetings myself. Um, I do, uh, get on the email list. I do respond, uh, occasionally, but I, I am just as guilty. So I think that's going to be my own personal challenge. And I challenge everyone else to, you know, just to interact and, um, and do more stuff like this. I I'm, I think a lot of people don't even know that there's two sides that you have a science-based side who's literally making no decisions, meaning you, you're just getting data, completely unbiased data. And then you have someone who's trying to, to put all that together, including hearing from fishermen and tackle stores, et cetera. 
and, uh, and just local communities. So, uh, yeah, I learned a lot on this one. It's been good. And we'll, we'll definitely have to get, Hey, my other daughter, <laughs> say hello. Hello. Hiya. What kind of fish are you going to catch this weekend? I don't know. That's a beautiful thing, man. You never know. What do you think? A catfish. Oh, yeah. a slimy catfish. <laughs> meow, meow. <laughs> so I guess that would be the other failure is our kids just go out catfishing all the time, right? Oh, gosh. There's plenty yeah. of them. Catfish and, lady, and ladyfish. Yeah, if catfish population is strong, I can tell you that for sure. Yes. I caught a massive catfish last week, and I'm not very proud of it, but. Well, hey, man, whatever happens. So, yeah, I want to encourage, encourage you to continue to, you know, this relationship with, with me specifically and any of your listeners that have any questions about the science management. I, I may not have the direct answers, but I can certainly plug you in where, it, where it's uh, appropriate. Uh, so they can reach out to me on uh, email would be probably the best way. I'm not a real active social media guy, but uh, um, yeah, that's what's email. Yeah, Eric, uh, E-R-I-C dot weather, like the weather outside at myfwc.com. Um, yeah, feel free to email me. and. And I'll, uh, I'll respond as soon as I can. Man. Cool. Well, that says a, a lot about you and, and FWC in general. I mean, they, I, I, once again, I think there's that misconception that you guys are just behind some closed door and don't want to hear from people. I mean, you, you do. I mean, you guys, for the most part, are all fishermen as well. Uh, I mean, you're doing this because you love it. I don't think you guys aren't sitting there getting paid crazy amounts of money. I mean, you're doing this because you truly love the water. You love the biology side of things. And, and you want to make sure that we don't destroy what we have. So. Well, that's absolutely right. Yep. You and I have a lot in common. You know, we could we could easily probably leave what we're doing today and go into work Monday for twice the money somewhere, <laughs> at least twice the money. But, you know, this is what we've chosen to focus our, our lives on. So I appreciate yep. that. Yes, sir. And so um, definitely reach out. We're not going to put his uh, email in the show notes. So make sure you got it. It's Eric with a C and then dot weather yep. at FWC, myfwc.com, right? Nailed it. Okay, perfect. And we'll put, we will put the show notes, all the other links that we, uh, we talked about, and that'll all be at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. You can also learn a little bit more about the Insider Club, and maybe we'll find a link for the FWC Insider Club as well. Yeah, yeah, I got to find that first myself, man. <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, thank you uh, again, and uh, hopefully, yeah, we can all go out and do a little, uh, little fishing this, uh, this summer. Let's make it happen. My kids would love to do that. It'll be a blast. All right, brother. Take care. Oh, man. Thanks, buddy.